Hey guys, and welcome to chapter 26. Um, I don't, I don't know if it's how you guys feel right now, but it, it's it's starting to feel a little chilly. I hope you guys uh, all brought a sweater, because it's time for the Cold War. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is actually something that I happen to know a lot about, even though I'm not old enough to have lived through it, at least not the beginning. Um, this is actually what I wrote my uh, my senior thesis on in college, so I have a lot of information about this. I'll try not to bore you with all the details of my specific thesis, but this is actually a really interesting time in American history, and I'm looking forward to discussing it with you guys right now. Here's what we're going to be looking at. What happens once war is over? We spent so much time building up to World War II, and we spent so much time discussing it, but then what do you do when it's over? It's kind of a weird transition for America. We're going to be discussing that transition during these chapters. Then we're going to look at how American foreign policy is going to change. We're going to do things a little bit differently than we did after World War I, so we're going to be discussing that. Uh, then we're going to talk about the uh, Korean War and the origins of the American Cold War with the Soviet Union. And then we're going to look at how the Americans are going to respond to problems that we are facing with world crises um, how are we going to respond to those at home? That's essentially what the outlook of this chapter is going to be. So, let's dive right in. Demobilization, as we have discussed before, is the process of going from a war economy and a warlike society to, a, to one of peace. With the war over, the American public is going to demand that troops come home and that we return to a more isolationist attitude although we're going to soon learn that's not going to be possible. By 1948, the standing army is going to be whittled back down to 1.5 million, which still sounds like a lot of troops, but that's actually going to be a significant cutback from the amount we had during World War II. Life is not going to be easy for these returning vets. There's going to be a lack of jobs because the economy is going to spend a couple of years transitioning. Um, and ironically, the divorce rate is going to spike. A bunch of uh, young couples got married with the romance of war, if that makes sense. And then uh, once they came home, they realized, wow, I really can't stand you. More than a million defense jobs are going to vanish within less than a year. And women are actually going to be encouraged to leave the economy and go back into the homes. That way they could make room for a male that is returning from fighting. So the economy is going to go through a pretty drastic shift during this time period because of all of that. There's also going to be something called the GI Bill of Rights, or the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, or the GI Bill. Look at all those different names. This is actually designed ahead of time to prevent the upcoming uh, possible recession once the war was over. Uh, this also is going to serve as a reward for people fighting in the war. So as a way of saying, hey, thank you for your service, gentlemen, this is going to essentially be an incentive and uh, a thank you for your service. This uh, law is going to make it so that way uh, there's going to be priority hiring for jobs, for veterans, job training, and up to 52 weeks of unemployment benefits if returning servicemen cannot find a job. The government is also going to uh, be willing to pay for a four years of college, up to a bachelor's degree, for those of you keeping track at home. 1.5 million veterans are going to attend college in 1946 alone, many for the first time in their family. This leads to an increase in new colleges, specifically for us here in California, the Cal State system is going to really be born because of the need for more colleges after World War II. Veterans are going to make up nearly half of all college students by 1947. To make room for the men, many colleges began to limit the number of women who could enroll. The amount of women enrolled in college is going to drop to, to below 40% during this time period. Within 10 years of the end of World War II, by 1956, nearly 10 million veterans had used the GI Bill to go to college. Higher education became an accepted and integral part of the American dream. And now, because you're listening to my big, beautiful radio voice right now, you're all expected to go to college. Before World War II, that wasn't going to be a reality pretty much for any Americans, really. Except for the, uh, the rich. Hey, look, I have a software update, and you just heard about it. Anyway, um, 
this idea of going to college is really going to really exist because of the post-World War II economy and the GI Bill of Rights. No GI Bill of Rights, maybe no AP program, and maybe you're not listening to me right now, and maybe none of us would have been born, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This is also going to provide low interest rate loans for veterans who wanted to start their own businesses or buy, buy homes or farms. And again, this is going to add another part to the American dream of homeownership, which is going to be a reality for many Americans post-World War II. But we'll discuss that later. Over 4 million veterans are going to buy houses using this program, leading to a rise in marriage and a sharp increase in the birth rate, leading to what we call a baby boom. But this doesn't mean that we blow up babies. It means that uh, there's going to be a huge influx of babies born. In the 20-year post-war period, as we call it, the birth rate is going to increase dramatically. You guys can take a look at this uh, these population pyramids here. If you look in the center, you'll notice that at the very bottom in 1950, about really 10 and a half, maybe 11% of the total U.S. population is going to be under the age of 5. That's significantly higher than it would be nowadays. Now it's closer to 6%, maybe 7 So there's going to be a huge get jump, and that's going to stay that way for a while. In fact, in the United States, um, there is a baby born every 7 seconds during the baby boom. That's a lot of babies. This is also going to lead uh, to in increases in businesses focusing on children. Toys are going to be created. Marketing is going to be focused on children and what children want. And we kind of, maybe it's a remnant from the war, but we kind of go out of our way to invent this idea of a childhood. We have this new idea that, you know what? Children should be able to play, go to school, and have no other real responsibilities. Whereas 50 years before this, before the baby boom, before World War I, children might get to go to school, but they're also kind of expected to work either in a factory or on a farm. After World War II, that's not going to be the case anymore, and we're going to invent this concept of a childhood. The GI Bill of Rights is going to cost the U.S. government over $15 billion, but is going to propel many Americans into the middle class. 60% of Americans are in the middle class by 1957, which is going to increase demand for goods and services, which is designed to help the economy keep flowing. So even though this costs a lot of money, it is isn't uh, a net benefit for the country. In fact, because the war is over, there's going to be a huge economic boom in America. Being an American during the late 1940s and early 1950s is probably one of the best times to be alive in this country. Pretty much everyone's making money. There are good jobs available once, once the economy is going to shift to a peacetime economy. Um, there's good jobs available. There is a, uh, a lot of money available and good wages for jobs available. This is a great time to be an American, and some people consider this um, one of the legacies of the greatest generation is that they also got to live during the really best, most affluent time in American history. What do I mean by that? Well, during the war, there's going to be a lot of people that are working full time, but they're not able to earn or be able to spend, I should say, a penny. They can't spend any money. So once this war is over and the economy finally does shift back to consumer goods, consumers are sitting on $135 billion that they are desperate to spend on something. And now that things are going to be available to buy, these Americans are going to be buying goods like crazy. Again, it's going to really jumpstart the American economy. New products like televisions. Half of all U.S. households have a TV by 1953. Automatic transmissions on cars, freezers, and air conditioners are going to lure consumers. And suddenly we develop a society based off of having the newest and best product and newest and best technology that comes from the post-war era. To encourage consumers to keep buying products, though, manufacturers are going to start doing something pretty evil. And it's something we still live with today. It's something called planned obsolescence. It's a fancy way of saying products are designed to only last maybe one or two years. For example, as I'm recording this in 2015 while watching a football game before it rains, cell phones, pretty much about every two years, you kind of need to get a new cell phone. Maybe they stop working, the, um, the technology improves, to be honest, and then uh, you know, old or apps won't run on old phones anymore and stuff like that. But really, we don't des we don't design things to get better or to be able to be improved. We design things to 
break and to force you to buy a new one every couple of years. This is planned obsolescence, and this is really going to start happening during this time period. At the same time as the United States is booming economically at home, we're also going to really kind of assert our dominance with the economy when it comes to the rest of the world. The Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944 is basically going to establish the United States as the economic leader of the world. It establishes something called the International Monetary Fund, which is going to stabilize exchange rates between countries, and it basically establishes world currency, or it values other currencies in relation to the U.S. dollar. So it essentially puts the U.S. dollar at the center of the world when it comes to the economy. Now at this point, the United States, after World War II, is going to be like the unquestioned leader of the economy and really one of the unquestioned leaders of the economic output of the world. It's a pretty uh, drastic transition from where we were, you know, before the war. Really, really big drastic change. So the economy is booming during this time period. So this should be a pretty easy time to be president, right? And we have my boy, Harry Truman, riding high after winning World War II. He's been president for a couple of months, and he essentially gets the credit for winning World War II, even though he was basically just sitting in the chair when it happened. Um, anyway, Truman, my boy, is, right, is living in one of the greatest economies of all time. But he realizes something. Truman loves the concept of the New Deal and that the government should be involved in the daily lives of Americans. But he realized the American public did not want to go through another expensive round of guessing when it came to the economy. So even though he would call himself a New Deal Democrat, he's actually going to cut a lot of government programs to get rid of waste. He believed every dollar had to go through the office of the president, which is why he had a sign on his desk that says the buck stops here. It's a fancy way of saying he wants to try to save the American public money by reducing the expense of government. Again, even though he's a Democrat, he's going to be very big on trying to reduce the expense of government. He also says that the U.S. government should be responsible to check the employment of the American public. The Employment Act of 1946 is going to make the federal government responsible for American employment. And now we kind of judge how the U.S. economy is doing, and we really judge how the American government is running based off of the unemployment report. And it comes out every week, and we try to guess and gauge how many jobs are available uh, and how many jobs have opened up over the last week or last month. And the idea is that if people are working, it's good for the American economy. So... Um, that is what the Employment Act of 1946 does. Congress at this time was also trying to reassert their authority and take it away from the president. Um, there's going to be a big problem with inflation during this time period, and Congress is going to try to um, really stop that going on. They do a pretty decent job. But at the same time, it's really difficult to legislate the economy. So what starts to happen is that... It, as Americans are buying goods, prices for goods are going to slowly rise because businesses want to make more money, obviously. And this is going to cause, because costs start to increase and inflation starts to increase after the war, um, it's going to encourage businesses to reduce hours and increase prices for goods to, you know, stay competitive or to stay open, I should say. And as we know, every time a business is going to lower amount of hours working, labor unions are going to go on strike. In 1946, there are numerous strikes all over the country, and over 4.5 million Americans go on strike, demanding that they're going to get a full amount of hours and enough money to really support the new lifestyle that they all want. One big strike is going to involve this union called the United Mine Workers, who are going to go on strike for 40 days. And it gets so serious that the American public is starting to, you know, freeze to death. Because, again, we use the mines for heat. This story is very similar to Theodore Roosevelt's. Um, but what's a little bit different about this one is that Truman basically looks at the union and says, all right, here's what's going to happen. You guys are going to settle this issue right now, or I'm going to call a draft. I'm going to draft every mine worker and then send them back into the mine as part of the army, whether they like it or not. We'll worry about the Constitution later. The Union ends up backing down, and the workers go back to work, and the American public doesn't freeze to death. But 
Because of this and some other uh, missteps by Truman when he is president, his polling numbers are actually going to go down. It's a strange time period where the economy is actually doing relatively well, but the American president is actually going to have low approval ratings because he makes a couple of mistakes. At the same time, the American public is actually really afraid of something. If you're not wearing a sweater now, you better go get one because it's time to discuss the Cold War. Okay, so for once, I actually went back and re-listened to part of this lecture, and I realized that you guys might get confused by something. I've talked about the economy doing great, and also uh, high inflation and the economy doing poorly. So let's put it to you this way. The economy, like over a 15 year time period, the economy is growing and things are great in America. But in the middle of that process, in the middle of that 15 years, we have individual moments that things are a little rough. So the last part I just mentioned about uh, some businesses going on strike and cutting back hours, that's going to specifically be in the year 1946. But if you look at the entire American post-war economy of a 15-year time span from 1945 to 1960, the American economy is doing great. So I apologize for going back and forth about what I'm saying, but that actually is kind of the story. In general, over a 15-year time period, awesome, even though there's going to be a couple of hiccups as we transition. I hope I cleared that up for you. Okay, now let's dive into the Cold War. So, things are going to go a little crazy after World War II is over. And I mean, it makes logical sense, right? If you think about it, the Soviet Union uh, has brought in a lot of troops to uh, get rid of the Nazis in Eastern Europe. And now that the Nazis are gone, Eastern Europe is pretty much occupied by the Soviets already. And... There's really no one to stop Stalin from doing whatever the heck he wants because there's no other really powerful army in the world except for us, and we've decided to leave. So, really, Stalin has every advantage here. Even before World War II ended, there were problems were emerging between the U.S. and the USSR when it came to our philosophies of what should happen in post-war Europe. The big issue, as discussed at Yalta and Potsdam, was what to do and how we should run this region. Do we just give it all back like we did after World War I and just see what happens? That obviously failed. So there needs to be some other system and some other way of handling post-war Europe. Stalin is going to insist on a demilitarized Germany and a buffer zone of friendly nations on the USSR's, well, eastern or western border, I should say, with Eastern Europe. That's why Europe's so complicated. Can't you just have an ocean in between? It makes it so much easier for us. Anyway, he calls this the Soviet sphere of influence and said it was no different than the dozens of military bases the United States has all over the world. It, we have military bases to protect us, so the Soviet Union should have the same thing. Stalin's going to use his millions of troops stationed in Eastern Europe to establish pro-communist governments all over Eastern Europe. And basically, within a matter of a couple of months, Eastern Europe's going to fall under Soviet control. Soon, countries like Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, well, maybe not so much Czechoslovakia, but definitely Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are all going to start to fall under the Soviet sphere of influence, and there's really not much they can do. They're pretty much going to be held captive by the Soviet Union. In fact, that's what the Soviet Union is. It is basically a collection of all of these Eastern European countries that Russia is going to eat during this time period. While FDR was, I don't want to say ambivalent about Stalin's actions, now that FDR is dead, Truman can basically see through Stalin, and he realizes that Stalin is really going to end up being no different than the expansionist policies of Hitler. He demands, sorry, Truman is going to demand a free Europe and saw, and saw Stalin's actions as a declaration of war and a betrayal of democracy and everything the war was about. Truman did not want to establish a policy of appeasement with Stalin because really you can't appease someone that's a dictator because they're just going to keep demanding and demanding and demanding. He argued that the balance of power and the buffer zones that the Soviet Union was calling for was the exact same thing that started the first two world wars. We realized that only self-determination could ensure peace throughout the world. 
what's the point of fighting Hitler if we just give this land all over to Stalin? It's really just doing the exact same thing. But at the same time, Truman also wants to protect American business interests in Europe. If the communists control the region and the area falls to communism or socialism, we are not going to be able to trade with Eastern Europe. If Eastern Europe becomes a communist region, they're not going to trade with capitalist America. So it's in our best interest if we ensure freedom and democracy and capitalism in this region. That's what we're going to want because it ensures our best interests. Truman is able to make some bold statements and declarations to the Soviets about how the world should be run and how Europe should be run, because at this point, we are the only country that has big, giant, scary bombs. But that's not going to be true forever. By 1946, Stalin had decided to stop cooperating with the West. He has basically now fully taken over Eastern Europe, calling them Soviet satellites, and forced Eastern Europe to stop trading with the West. Stalin even gives a speech where he says that he will no longer work with the capitalism and he will begin a military buildup in order to become superior to the United States. Whoa, that's kind of scary. The U.S. does not want to go to open war with the Soviet Union. There would be no clear winner, even at this point. Granted, the Soviet Union got their, you know, a lot of people died during World War II for the Soviet Union. We really don't know how powerful they are. We don't really know how powerful Russia really is if we had to go fight them one-on-one. -on -one. Everyone else has failed to invade Russia. What chance do we really stand? Granted, we're the greatest army in the world, but Russia's a very, very big place, and we really don't want to go into a full-on fight with them. But we also realize that it would be a really bad idea to let communism spread throughout all of Europe. This dude, his name is George F. Keenan. He's an American diplomat at the time period. He's going to come up with a new policy for the United States. It's this idea called containment. I need you guys to put 15 stars um, around this word and uh, circle it 100 times, put kissy faces next to it, whatever it takes to remember this word. Containment. Here's the idea. We can't stop communism from existing, but we want to stop it from spreading. Does this sound familiar to you? almost like how America felt about slavery before the American Civil War. We're not gonna be able to stop slavery legally from existing at that time period, but we can stop its spread. Well, guess what? Same thing's gonna happen here when it comes to communism. We can't really stop the Soviet Union in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but we can make sure that communism does not spread and take over any other countries. That's what containment is. We are going to stop the spread of communism to other countries in Europe at any cost. Churchill, who is now no longer prime minister, is going to give a speech at a college in Missouri. He states that an iron curtain has descended upon Europe and that the English-speaking democratic countries needed to band together to prepare for a fight between democracy and communism. Truman is going to agree. In late 1946, Congress authorizes the Atomic Energy Commission, which was designed to produce as many atomic and nuclear weapons as possible in the off chance that we would need them. By 1952, the first hydrogen bomb had been developed. It is 1,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. By mid-1946, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union had officially begun. But, you might be asking yourself, what is a Cold War? The Cold War is defined as a war with no real outright hostilities, but there's going to be a very big military buildup, economic tensions, propaganda, and proxy wars fought between the U.S. and USSR. The United States and the Soviet Union never directly fight each other throughout this 50-year time period. But each side is convinced that a fight can break out at any moment and they have to be ready for it. It's essentially an ideological conflict between capitalism or democracy and communism. The thing is, guys, these two theories about how an economy should be run are mutually exclusive. One can't exist while the other one does. If the world's going to be capitalistic, then every country needs to buy from every other country. And if the world is going to be communistic, Every country has to buy in, and there can't be any capitalist countries that have a different system. Both of these systems only work if everyone in the world goes along with them. 
And now we have the two biggest superpowers after World War II having a disagreement on what the world should look like. And they both have big, powerful, scary weapons that could lead to a big, nasty, dangerous fight. Let me show you a picture about the uh, increase in weapons during this time period. Okay, so Hiroshima, the big devastating bomb that's going to be involved in the destruction of Japan that ends World War II. Check it out. Um, now, if you look, that's that picture here on the left. If you look at the right where that circle is, that's how small Hiroshima would be. Then there's going to be Trinity, which is another atomic bomb. And now we've developed bombs that are a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. You could see uh, Ivy Mike here, Bravo, and then the largest bomb ever tested and ever built is called Tsar Bomba by the Soviet Union. So look at the difference in scale between Tsar Bomba and then Hiroshima, which looks like, in, or like minuscule. But remember how many people the Hiroshima bombs killed in a heartbeat. That is the level of weapon that we have. And this is why, once the U.S. and USSR both develop these weapons, this is why we're going to be reluctant to outright fight each other. Because if one of us were to drop one of these bombs, a, a bomb like the size of Tsar Bomba, if one of us were to drop a bomb this big in this region, it could lead to insane devastation. I've read some reports that said... If you strategically dropped seven bombs the size of Tsar Bomba around the world, you could essentially set humanity back a thousand years. Seven. Here's what's scary. We have over 75,000 hydrogen bombs between the United States and the Soviet Union today as of 2015. If that doesn't terrify you, I don't know what does. And this is the reality of what Americans are living with during what we call the Cold War. There's going to be a lot of tensions and a lot of fear that are spread throughout the world because we have bombs that could possibly end humanity as we know it. It's a scary reality, but it's the reality of what this war is, and it's why both sides don't want to directly fight. Okay, here's your warning. This is what I wrote my senior thesis on when I was in college. Uh, was about this transition of American foreign policy and about containment. So I apologize ahead of time if I start to ramble a little bit. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. But this is what I spent three months of my life uh, researching and what I ended up getting published in that historical journal. So again, I know a lot about this. And if you want to read that article, feel free to ask. I won't let you read my actual copy of it, though, because I don't want your tears of joy to stain the paper, because, you know, it's important to me because it's published. I'll make you print out your own copy. That way you can cry on it and ruin your own. Okay, so, sorry. <clears throat> After the war, <laughs> the British assumed a majority role in taking care of Europe. The United States is going to temporarily go really isolationist, so Great Britain is going to be taken upon themselves to prevent tragedy happening in Europe. The problem is Great Britain doesn't really have any money themselves. They're really weak as a country after the war, and they're not really going to be capable of stopping the spread of communism. In February of 1947, Great Britain's going to tell the United States that they're basically out of money and resources and are no longer able to babysit Europe. And unless we, the United States, want Europe to fall to communism, we better step up. There's actually two big regions of the world that are going to go through some uh, problems. Remember, our foreign policy, we've decided, is going to be to contain the spread of communism. So there are two places in Europe that communism is about to spread. Number one is Greece, which, you know, is the cradle of democracy and where the concept of democracy came from. So if Greece falls to communism, that's like a real kick in the teeth. Like, that's probably not good if the birthplace of our economic and, not economic, sorry, our political system were to fall to communism, that might look bad. So we don't want Greece to fall to communism. And at the same time, we're also really concerned about this country called Turkey falling to communism. Turkey is going to be a really important military strategic area because Turkey is going to be the country that basically connects the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. There is a, um, what's it called? I'm blanking on it now, which of course I don't have it in my notes, so I can't help myself. Um, there is a channel, thank you, 
uh, called the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus. Actually, they're straits, same thing. That is going to connect the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, through all of history, if you can have access to trade on the Mediterranean Sea, if you can have access for your boats to get to the Mediterranean Sea, you can make a lot of money and be available in trade. Russia doesn't touch the Mediterranean Sea. That's always bothered them. What Russia is really going to want to focus on is to try to find a way to have easy access to the Mediterranean Sea. And the only way Russia can do that is by going through this country called Turkey and going from the Black Sea all the way into the Mediterranean. So right now, Russia is really focused on getting Turkey on their side. They want Turkey to join the Soviet Union and they want Greece to join the Soviet Union. So, these are both two really big problems happening in 1947, and now the U.S. really has to decide something. We just said that containment is going to be our policy, and now we have two countries that are about to fall to communism that we have to decide as a country if we're actually going to back up and help. On March 12, 1947, President Harry Truman is going to get up in front of Congress and the American people. He's going to give a speech. He asked for $400 million to stop the civil war in Greece and to protect the Turkish pe people from invasion. Congress is going to approve these funds, and the Truman Doctrine, as it's called, comes into being. The United States, because of the Truman Doctrine, the Truman Doctrine states that the United States is now actively engaged in containing communism wherever it spreads throughout the world. Wherever we see communism, we are going to fight it. That is what containment is, and that's what the United States is going to be doing during this time period. To help us do this, we're going to establish something called the National Security Act, which is going to unify the military under one department called the Department of Defense. And we're also going to establish something called the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA. The CIA's job is to do espionage around the world, to check for communist activity, that way the United States can be involved in stopping it. And now you know why the CIA exists. On top of that, the Truman Doctrine is going to be expanded with the creation of something called the Marshall Plan. The logic of the Marshall Plan is that Europe is in shambles during this time period. So what if the United States gave free money to Western Europe? free money to European countries to help them rebuild themselves. Now, we're not even at, we're not it's not even really a loan. We're going to give them flat out free money to rebuild their countries. The logic being that if we give them free money to rebuild their countries and they do rebuild their countries and they start doing trade again, who are they going to trade with? The United States that helped them and gave them free money to rebuild or are they going to fall to communism, which is basically going to take them over and exploit them? The idea of the Marshall Plan is we give free money to Europe, help them rebuild, that way they can trade with us again. Over $17 billion is going to be invested in Europe by the United States. And it worked. By 1952, industrial production had risen 200% in Europe. The communist and socialist ideas in Western Europe don't really take off. These movements don't really gain a lot of power in Western Europe because the United States has effectively stopped it by giving free money to rebuild a capitalist society in this region. It's also going to force the Soviet Union to try to keep up with the United States economically, and it turns out they can't. They don't have the money or the resources to be able to keep up with the United States economically. The Soviet Union doesn't have any additional free money to give to the rest of the world to rebuild. It's part of the reason why they don't expand much further than they do at this time period. They don't have any additional money to give away, but we in the United States do. It's one of the big ways that we stop the spread of communism, at least to Western Europe. But then again, that's not the end of the story, because the Cold War has got a lot longer to go. So, how did the Soviets respond to the Marshall Plan, and how did they respond to the Truman Doctrine, and this idea of containment? How did they respond? They respond by strengthening their grip and tightening their grip on Germany, and really on Eastern Europe in general. Now, our story right now is going to be focusing on specifically the country of Germany. As you guys all know, at the Potsdam Conference, 
it's decided among the big three that Germany is going to be divided up into four main sections that are going to help the rebuilding process. There is a British zone, a French zone, an American zone, and the Russian zone. The Russian zone, the only problem with this, is that the capital city of Berlin was within the Soviet era. So, the powers that be also decided to split up Berlin into four parts as well. The logic being that each country would take a little bit of the burden of helping to rebuild this region and move forward from there. After the United States issues the Truman Doctrine, Stalin is going to block off Berlin from the rest of the world. Berlin is located in the Russian zone. Stalin is basically going to blockade and surround Berlin and not allow any traffic in or out. Truman is going to refuse to abandon Berlin and to allow, really, a big chunk of the German population to fall to communism. But he also doesn't want to start a war with Russia over this issue. And since he can't go in by the roads, he decides to show American superiority by going in by the air. He begins something called the Berlin Airlift. Over an 11-month period, the United States is going to land a plane into Berlin every three minutes to help the two million Berliners not fall to communism or starve to death. The airlift is going to show that the United States is prepared to use their massive supplies in order to back up their allies. It also shows that the Soviet Union is really not in the same class as we are just yet. Stalin is going to redouble his efforts in order to get the USSR up to speed with the United States. Perhaps you remember from last year on World History learning about these things called the five-year plan. This is where they come from. The fact that Russia is nowhere near as advanced as we are. Russia could not pull off a Berlin airlift like we did. After this event, the Western European uh, nations are going to band together with the United States and form something called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It basically says that we are going to work together to help each other. Um, in case one nation is attacked, the other nations are going to join in to help each other. It's basically a fancy way of saying us capitalistic uh, democratic countries are going to work together to make sure that if Russia were to go crazy and start fighting one of us, we're all going to join together to be involved. Stalin's going to counter and have something called the Warsaw Pact, which is the exact same thing, but for the communist countries in the region. Again, we're basically just posturing with each other at this point. As all this crazy stuff is going on in Europe, we have to do the whole democracy thing here at home and have an election. The year is now 1948, and it's time for Harry Truman to actually run as president himself. By the way, little side note, um, I cut this information out of the lecture previously, but uh, we finally now have an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that's going to limit the terms of the presidency. So FDR is able to run for four terms because there is no limitation on the length of the presidency. In 1947, Congress is going to pass the 22nd Amendment, which is going to limit the president to two terms or 10 years. So that officially happens in between this time period. Now, presidents can only be served for 10 years or two terms. Anyway, back to the story. So the year is now 1948, and Harry Truman has to run for president again. Thing is, though, there are some things in this country that are going to happen that he's going to have to have a response to. Really, President Truman is a very interesting man when he becomes president because, and when he's running for re-election, because he has a couple of different opinions. He's kind of controversial in the fact that he has different opinions about the way the country should be run. He's actually going to be our first president to really focus on this idea of civil rights. Harry Truman's from the South, and he realizes that there is a big boiling problem going on in the American South, and he wants to try to make some decisions about it early on. There's going to be a rise in racist activities in the South. World War II had given many rights and freedoms to black Americans in the military, and whites in the South are not going to be comfortable with this. Lynchings are going to be on the rise during this time period, and there are going to be a, a rise of other racial hate crimes. Truman's going to attempt to stop these problems and to try to help gain the black vote to, re to uh, ensure his re-election. He establishes something called the President's Committee on Civil Rights, which, de which was designed to research and detail the problems with segregation and Jim Crow laws in the South. 
It also called for governmental intervention on, in civil rights. Unfortunately, President Truman's going to be forced to back down because the Democrats in the South refuse to support him if he takes on this issue of civil rights. And Truman, much to his discredit, is actually going to back down and decide not to really fight this issue at this time period. Truman's also going to face a lot of problems when he's running for re-election. The American public is not going to be too happy with how the country is being run. And even though he issues the Truman Doctrine, many people are actually going to see Truman as being weak on this concept of communism. So much so that Truman's re-election is not guaranteed. In fact, up until right before the election, many people thought that Harry Truman was going to lose. The night of the election, a newspaper is published with the headline that the Republican contender for the presidency, a dude named Thomas Dewey, wins. This picture here at the bottom is one of the most famous political pictures of the time period. And the joke, of course, being that Truman actually does win re-election. Dewey doesn't defeat him. Hence, you know, the joke. And, just to confuse you, Harry Truman promises if he becomes president that he's going to offer Americans what he calls the fair deal. The idea is that the country should focus on civil rights, some sort of national health care legislation, and federal aid to promote education. The idea is to use the economic gains of this time period to help improve the country. And some of these things actually happen. Congress does raise the minimum wage. Congress does increase Social Security benefits and increase benefits to the poor. However, the rest of the fair deal is going to be ignored, especially when it comes to civil rights. And it's going to be ignored because the country is going to be distracted from improving itself because we have to go stick our nose in another war. We have to go test containment somewhere else. We have to go test containment in Asia. We are going to build to the Korean War. You guys hear that? It's raining. That's so rare I thought it was worth pointing out while I'm recording. Isn't it so relaxing when you're studying for a big scary test and you just hear the rain? I'm nice and calm right now, but you guys are probably freaking out about a test. So anyway, let's uh, get to the Cold War in Asia. Now remember, the whole point of this chapter is about that big giant C word, containment. We've already tested containment with the potential civil war in Greece and the problems going on in Turkey. And that was actually the Truman Doctrine was to establish our help in that region. Well, now containment is going to be tested in Asia because the next biggest region that Russia might try to expand into is going to be with the rest of Asia. And remember, Russia touches a bunch of Asian countries, so it would make sense for the communist ideal to possibly spread into this region. And it turns out the Cold War does not go so well here for us in the United States when it comes to the Cold War in Asia. The U.S. is going to occupy and control Japan until 1952, but the U.S. is going to remain a protector in the region, and actually still does to this day. In China, specifically, the United States is going to face its biggest problem. A civil war breaks out between the nationalist government of this dude named uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the communist forces of Mao Zedong. So, uh, a poor communist pictured here on the right named Mao Zedong is going to basically st start a civil war in China over different economic theories. The U.S. is going to support Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek is corrupt and disliked among the Chinese people, but that doesn't matter because he's not a communist. We're going to support him. So we're going to support a guy that is not really that great of a guy just because of the simple fact that he is not a communist. On the other hand, Mao Zedong at this time period is actually very popular with the people in China, and he's going to do a lot to win their support. It would be a really bad idea if the most populous country in the, nation, in the world is going to fall to communism, but in 1949, that's exactly what happens. To make matters worse, Mao Zedong and Stalin are going to agree to work together. In 1949, the Soviet Union is also going to drop their first atomic bomb. This is going to shatter the United States' feeling of invincibility. There's going to be a rise of purchasing bomb shelters, and American students are going to be taught how to duck and cover, something I think you guys may have all practiced before. Truman is a little concerned by the fact that the Soviet Union has somehow obtained the secrets to atomic energy, uh, as well as the 
uh, is starting to be concerned about U.S. foreign policy. So he establishes something called NSC-68, which is basically a major arms buildup in order for the United States to keep up with the Soviet Union. The plan is going to end up being very expensive, and it's only going to work because of another major war that's about to break out. It's called the Korean War. So China has already fallen to communism, and America is starting to look really weak in Asia. Things are not going well. And on top of that, another country is actually about to start to fall to communism as well. There's going to be a war that happens in the country of Korea, uh, because Korea, after, the, after uh, World War II, is going to be divided along the 38th parallel. Korea had been controlled by Japan during World War II, and once the war is over, they basically realize that North and South Korea want to have different economic philosophies. North Korea wants to be communist. South Korea wants to be capitalist. So, after World War II, Korea is going to be split in two along the 38th parallel. Well, long story short, North Korea is going to decide to invade South Korea. And because this is a communist country invading a non-communist country, the United States is going to help non-communist South Korea. But see, what really ends up happening here is that this looks like it's a war between the Korean people, but really this is actually going to be the United States fighting a war against uh, Asian, so Asian communist forces. And really, those communist forces are going to be helped out, of course, by the Soviet Union. On June 4th, 1950, the North Koreans are going to invade South Korea. North Korea is backed with Soviet weapons and Chinese troops, and the United States is going to give military support to South Korea. Truman is going to call for a limited war from the very beginning. He does not want this to become a World War II-esque conflict, because if it does, there's a very big possibility that each country, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, could end up dropping atomic bombs on each other. That's not a good thing. So Truman's going to call for a very limited war. Truman is going to appoint this dude named General MacArthur, pictured here in the bottom left with a big giant pipe, and really, really high pants, or, or, let's give him credit, he could have a very short torso. I don't know, but those pants are disproportionately high. Anyway, he's actually a, a brilliant uh, military general who helped us win World War II in the Pacific. At first, the North Koreans are going to put on a heavy offensive and conquer a lot of territory. If you look at this picture here in the bottom right, you can see the red arrows pointing down. Um, by September of 1950, the North Koreans have essentially captured all the way down to that bottom right-hand quarter. The U.S. is going to be pushed down to the very bottom of Korea, and now we're going to really start to uh, join into this war and get a really big offensive going on. And we're going to end up actually pushing the North Koreans beyond the 38th parallel. So take a look at the green arrows going up. That's going to be the United States troops pushing the North Koreans back. MacArthur wanted to go all in at this point and actually end up invading China, but the United States said no. MacArthur decides to invade anyway, and he is met by the Chinese troops. MacArthur is eventually going to end up having his army pushed all the way back to the 38th parallel, and now both sides are back exactly where they started, and now they're stuck in a stalemate. No one side can gain an advantage over any other. Truman's going to call for diplomacy at this point to end the war, while MacArthur is going to call for more military might. MacArthur wanted to actually drop atomic bombs all along the coastline in order to stop North Korea and then actually intimidate China. His goal was to drop so many atomic bombs and kill so many people that the Chinese government would decide to no longer be communist and not support and not go along with communism. Truman was horrified by this idea. He was horrified by the fact that MacArthur may actually drop atomic bombs all over Asia. That would not look good, and who knows how the Soviet Union would respond to that. Truman is going to say, you know what? The president is the one that makes this call, not the military. So he brings MacArthur home and fires him immediately. MacArthur is actually going to end up returning to the United States as a Public. Yeah, I have another software update. While Truman's public opinion is going to plummet because he fired a very popular military general. Fighting's going to continue, and after two more years, the fighting's going to remain at a standstill. 
the two sides are going to reach an armistice, which means a ceasefire in 1953, and the border remains. Over 52,000 U.S. soldiers died, and the cost of the war was about $54 billion, and this war achieved absolutely nothing. Both sides, North and South Korea, agreed to split exactly where they had already split. During this time period, the United States is going to continue our arms buildup. The U.S. is going to quadruple the number of nuclear warheads, double the size of the standing army, and spend 500% more, more on military spending during and after the war. While the Korean War is seen as a failure for the United States, as it should be, it did keep the tenuous balance of power in Asia, and it showed that the United States is willing to stop the spread of communism. Now, at this point, North Korea and China... Uh, have both fallen to communism, and we're not sure if the rest of Asia is going to follow along. The Korean War never officially ends. The U.S. stops fighting, but technically, North and South Korea are still at war today, and they've had a very tenuous balance between the two. Perhaps you've heard about a lot of it in the news. But that is the story of the Korean War. Spoiler alert, things aren't looking so good for the United States when it comes to the Cold War in Asia. We're losing. As, I mean, if you think about where we are right now, China has fallen to communism. The United States has just lost a war with Korea, a war that we really should have won. China's fallen to communism, Korea's fallen to communism, and really the United States is not winning this Cold War. We're not winning. So the country's going to get a little concerned with the threat of communism coming to our shores. It doesn't help the fact that the Russians have now dropped an atomic bomb. And how is it possible that the Russians have gotten the atomic bomb so quickly? How could the U.S. have done so poorly with our war in Asia? There must be spies in our country that are giving this information away to the Soviet government. The second Red Scare is going to affect millions of Amer Americans. We're going to go through this time period of being super, super cautious and being convinced that every single person in this country is secretly a communist sympathizer. This may sound a little similar to what happened after World War I with the Palmer Raids, and it should be because it is similar. It's the same idea. It also kind of coincides with how the United States today is a little cautious of Muslim Americans, mainly because of the idea that uh, of the terrorist attacks in the United States being caused by Muslims. So it's going to be the same sort of idea where we go through this really intense, really uh, racist time period and really accusatory time period in American history where we accuse anyone who is not American enough. This is also coincidentally a time period of like super hardcore patriotism because everybody wants to convince everyone else that they are not the ones that are communist. So everyone is super patriotic during this time period. Um, and also, everyone's looking at everyone else to see who the real communist sympathizers are. Because there has to be some spy somewhere. In March of 1947, Truman is going to establish something called the Federal Employee Loyalty Program, which is going to bar anyone who is a member of the Communist Party from having any federal or government job. If there was any reasonable suspicion, there's going to be grounds for your dismissal. Even something like, for example, being a homosexual is going to make the country say, you know what, nope, you can't work for the government. People who are going to accuse others of being communist are not required to reveal their sources, and the accused never got to face the people who charged them with any sort of crime. Mere criticism of U.S. policy could lead to a dismissal from your job. Of the 4.7 million people who applied for federal jobs by 1952, 560 of them are going to be fired or denied government employment based on their background. Here's the interesting thing, though. Despite all of this, no evidence of spying in the government was ever found through this program. So the government's going to interview 4.7 million people looking for communism, and they don't find it. That's kind of a... Uh, a good example of this time period. Let's talk about some other ways and some other ways that we're going to go out and looking for spies. 
The existence of the Federal Employee Loyalty Program is going to lead to hysteria nationwide. There's basically going to be a witch hunt that's going to sweep the nation. By 1953, 39 states had installed loyalty programs similar to the national one, and even teachers had to sign oaths saying they would not promote communism in their classroom. Did you guys know I've actually signed one of those oaths? One of the first teaching contracts I ever signed said that I will, I will never teach or promote the tenets of communism in a positive light. It seems strange, but I really did sign one. In 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee began to have hearings to expose communist influence on the average American life. People who were called in front of the HUAC faced a problem. They could either admit to their communist leanings or be forced to rat out everyone they knew. Of course, they could argue that the First and Fifth Amendments protect them from having to testify or having to accuse others of communism, but if you claimed, oh, I plead the Fifth Amendment, I'm not a communist, you have to prove it, that just proves you are a communist. That's what a commie would say. A true American could prove their patriotism. And in fact, a lot of people are going to admit to committing quote-unquote crimes or admit to being a communist, even when they aren't. Ooh, look, we're talking about something dangerous and foreboding in American history, and the rain's starting to pick up. People were called out in front of the HUAC for very minor things. One of my favorite stories about this was that um, somebody is driving down the street, and they stop at a stop sign. By the way, why are they painted red? That sounds communist. Anyway, they stop at a stop sign, and as they stop, they look out to the right, and they look into their neighbor's window, and in their neighbor's window, they actually see the bookshelf in the neighbor's house, and there is a book with a red binding on that bookshelf. The person in the car is going to notify the HUAC, and the HUAC is going to put that neighbor uh, under arrest to have them testify about communist ideals because somebody saw a red book on a bookshelf while they were 50 feet away at a stop sign. That seems silly and crazy, but that's what this time period is like. Again, it's a mass hysteria during this time period. And in fact, one odd place that are going to be attacked by the United, or by the United States government is actually going to be Hollywood. Ten directors, conveniently known as the Hollywood Ten, are going to be targeted by the HUAC for refusing to testify about communist ideas in Hollywood. These ten directors are going to be blacklisted from Hollywood and were unable to work in the industry anymore. Over 500 actors or directors are going to be blacklisted and they were no longer allowed to work in Hollywood. They're called the Hollywood Ten. Basically, the government says, will you testify? And they all said no. So the government says, fine, you can't work ever again. It's a big giant scare tactic here in the United States, and everybody was afraid of everyone else accusing them of a crime, hence why everyone went like hardcore patriotic. So now we have the government looking for spies, we have states looking for spies, and now we have citizens looking for spies. So the question is, is there going to be some sort of, uh, hmm like big giant jury trial that the media can get involved in. Remember, everybody wants to be out looking for communists. Hey, by the way, you hear that rain? It's really picking up now. It can happen in California. I'm just as surprised as you are. Okay, so this story is way blown out of proportion, but if you ever see the name Alger Hiss on an AP exam, I just want you to associate it with communism and a show trial. This guy's going to be accused of being a communist. It's essentially what happens here. This dude named Whitaker Chambers is going to accuse this other guy, pictured here on the bottom left, of being a communist. Alger Hiss is um, arguably not a communist, but he does look the part. He was high class and polished, and he was a really big leftist. He was really liberal. Um, he is going to claim his innocence, and the Democrats are going to believe him. Hiss is going to be questioned by a, a up-and-coming political star named Richard Nixon, and eventually, long story short, Alger Hiss is going to be confused uh, is going to be accused of perjury. Perjury means that you lie under oath. He's asked a whole bunch of questions, and he doesn't really fully tell the truth to the U.S. government, which again is illegal because that's 
what this idea of perjury is. You're not allowed to lie under oath. He does. He's going to be thrown in jail for it. But again, was he a communist like they said? Eh, maybe, maybe not. The, the jury ha, is still out on it. But the point is, it doesn't matter because at this time period, just the thought that you can't 100% prove you're an American means you're not. Again, I know it's kind of a weird case. I'm not sure why this is the one that always comes up, but it does. Ooh, here's a better one. The Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. This is complicated as well. So again, don't get too hung up on the details. Just know that these people are going to be accused of communist activities during this time period. In the year 1950, a man in Britain is going to be accused of giving atomic secrets to the Soviets. That man is going to go to trial in Great Britain for this crime. In the process of his trial, he mentions knowing some Americans named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Now, these are American immigrants who also happen to be Jewish, and they're going to be put on trial for helping the Communist Party. In March of 1951, a jury found them guilty of espionage. Their judge said that their crime was worse than murder, and both were sentenced to death by the electric chair. They were executed in 1953, the first Americans to be executed for spying against the U.S. government. Here's the deal, though. Were they actively involved in this process? Maybe not. Were they told, okay, guys, you're going to pick up this briefcase and then drop it over here? But were they ever told what was in that briefcase? Probably not. So do we really have any good, solid evidence against these two? No. But do we murder them anyway? Yes, because that is the, the feeling of this time period. Again, the best word to use for it, and the word that is often used by textbooks, is hysteria. It doesn't matter if the evidence isn't really there, if you look the part, you must be guilty. This is that time period. And there's no one that better exemplifies this time period than Senator Joseph McCarthy. Pictured there in the bottom right. Not an attractive man. But basically, he's going to take advantage of the mass hysteria of this time period and is going to use it for his political gain. He's a Republican senator, and he's going to fuel anti-communist fire to epic heights. Upset after the law, after losing the 1948 election, the Republican Party is going to whip up the country into an anti-communist frenzy. Senator Joseph McCarthy is going to make a name for himself, saying he had a list of 205 people in the U.S. government who were communists. He offered no evidence to support his accusations, but the media is going to pick up on it. What he would do is he would, he would basically call people in front of the, the U.S. government, and he would make them testify and say whether or not they were a communist. But he was a really big bully. He was really mean to the people that he was having testify, and he didn't really have any evidence, and he would just basically yell and scream at people until they admitted to crimes that they did not do. Um, these are not really super, you know, legal jury cases like we would have today. Really, it's basically the government yelling at you. And then people started to get a little confused, like, how is it that this guy who was a senator, and um, I'm forgetting from which state, but it was not one of the, the important ones, how is it this guy that's a senator from a minor state somehow has a list of U.S. spies, but he's not giving up that list to anybody, and he's not explaining who these spies are, and he has no evidence? How is it possible that this guy po could possibly have all this information, but he's not giving it to the, you know, president? Why is a young senator the one that has all, the, all, all this information? Eventually, he runs out of people that he thinks are communists and starts just picking out random names from the U.S. government, and these people had done nothing wrong. Eventually, he's going to cause the U.S. He's going to accuse people in the U.S. Army of having spies. It's at this point that the American public goes, okay, you're probably full of it, so we're just not going to listen to you anymore. And he kind of disappears. But it didn't matter. For a couple of months, this one guy whips up the entire country into a mass hysteria over communism with no actual proof, and he didn't actually find anything. That's this time period. Let's end out this chapter. Let's end out chapter 26 by really... Um, not necessarily ending the communist problem in this country, because no, that's going to keep going to the end of the textbook. No, instead, we're going to be basically ending the 1940s 
and leading up to a moment known as, um, well, the good old days in American history of the 1950s. In the election of 1952, the Democrats stand no chance. McCarthyism is in full swing. The United States has just lost the Korean War. And basically, the Democrats could have run, could have gotten FDR out of, out of his grave and ran him, that's a horrible joke, and still would not have won this election because the Democrats had done so terribly the last couple of years running this country. The Democrats are going to choose this guy named Adelaide Stevenson. You've never heard of him. Uh, he's brilliant, but he's out of touch with the common people, so he's not going to be very electable. The Republicans are going to choose Dwight David Eisenhower. That's right, the guy that basically won World War II, the most famous military general in U.S. history, especially in recent times. Um, the guy's a political moderate, but he's going to actually join the Republican Party for this election. He is elected in a relative landslide. He has a huge um, popular mandate. And some things are going to change about this country in the 1950s. The New Deal era is officially over. And that is the end of this chapter. Good luck on your test, kiddos, and I will talk to you later.